last talk we're going to talk about is about is entitled Who Has the Power? So this is about power and voting systems, but just so we're clear who really has the power. Apparently, whoa. How could how many years? <laughs> has the power. <laughs> Let's take a look and see what this means for an election system. Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about the Senate for a minute. Okay. The current the current makeup of the Senate is that there are 52 Republicans, 46 Democrats, and two independents and currently in the Senate. Uh, now <clears throat> this would mean that if everybody voted completely on their own, okay meaning that they don't have any alliance to party lines or whatever, you might think that each one of those voters has about one one-hundredth of the power. Okay? Voting power. Seems pretty reasonable, right? However, on a partisan issue where everybody's expected to vote sort of party line, right? <clears throat> then, uh, and where only a simple majority is needed for something to pass, suddenly the 52 Republicans now hold all of the power. And the 46 Democrats and the two independents got nothing. Doesn't matter how they vote because the 52 Republicans will win every single time. So really, the Republicans, each Republican has 152nd of the total power, and nobody else has anything because you know, on a partisan issue where you're guaranteed to vote the party line, the Democrat vote means nothing. Okay? If they're guaranteed, doesn't the Republican vote also mean nothing? If it's guaranteed. Well, it just means that the Republicans are all choosing all vote. Right, right. So if it's like if it's like a if it's like a Democrat proposed bill or whatever, the Republicans will defeat it. If it's a Republican proposed bill, the Republicans will win it. The Republicans make all the decisions. What about the, the two independents? <laughs> well, even if they did, even if they did, say even if they voted against the Republicans, it's well, still only 50 people, or 48 people. So the Republicans still yeah, win. But it wouldn't be one over 52. To, to be one no, the, the, this is for the 52 Republicans. Within that group only the Republicans have power. The independents are irrelevant. Whether the independents vote for or against, it's irrelevant. Does that, does that make sense? So <clears throat> even, in, even though they're sort of, you know, could go either way, yes. they, they're not controlling any of the vote. The 52 Republicans have everything. Does that, does that make sense? <clears throat> okay, so the question really is here, what we're talking about is, is what makes power an election and who has the power? So I think another really good example of this is the Electoral College and why it was created in the first place. Okay? <clears throat> so the Electoral College is specifically designed to change the distribution of power in the presidential election. Okay? In fact, <clears throat> when it first came, when we first had it, we were talking, you know, the, the, when they were first drafting the Constitution, when they first think about just a straight popular vote, this essentially gives every voter, every, you know, at the, at the time, which would have only been like, I think, a land-owning male, right? Every voter would have had equal power to, to affect the election and, and vote for the president. But this wasn't acceptable to several parties in the, that were trying to draft the Constitution. And some of the different colonies said, we, wouldn't, we won't even ratify it unless you make some changes. And so the compromise was the notion of the Electoral College. And there's three main reasons why the Electoral College was created. The first one is that the drafters of the Constitution, which I'll call the Founding Fathers, believed that the electorate at large would be too easily manipulated because they couldn't get verifiable information. So they couldn't get educated about the issues of the time, and so it would be very easy for someone local to sway their vote. And so the idea was that instead of them voting directly for the president, they would elect people that they trust to be electors who would then go to, I guess it'd be Pennsylvania at the time, but Washington, D.C. effectively, and vote for them in, in their place by proxy and, and vote for the president because they would be able to be more informed. That was the original idea of why the Electoral College was there for one part. Another reason why the Electoral College made sense, and, and this is also why our, uh, how, our, our Congress, our, uh, Houses of Congress are built this way, is the smaller states felt that the states with larger populations, if everything was done by population, would have too much power. 
and basically every election would be controlled by New York and Pennsylvania and, and maybe Virginia, and nobody else would get anything, okay? And so the smaller states said, hey, you've got to change the way we represent things so that we can get more. And this is why we have both the, the Senate, which gives two representatives to every state, and the House of Representatives, which does representation by population. And the number of electors you get is equal to the number of congressional members you have. So a small state, which would have only been justified to get one member of the House of Representatives, still gets three electoral votes. So it increases sort of the weight that the smaller states would have compared to the larger states. And a third reason, which I think uh, we don't really talk too much about anymore, but is an interesting point in terms of distribution of power, is the southern slave-owning states really pushed to have the Electoral College and to have the representation in Congress uh, done under a different rule. You see, their problem was is they said, hey, we've got tons of people in our states, just not all of them can vote because we've got 500,000 slaves or whatever in the southern states. They're not allowed to vote, but they should still count for population because we want to represent them. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so their, their requirement, if they wanted to ratify the Constitution, was that each slave would have to be counted as three-fifths of a citizen in terms of representation. Okay? So that every so in, in other words, if a if a landowner had say ten slaves, then he gets represented by his one person plus three fifths, so six more for for his slaves. So he'd count as seven people, essentially. Is that just males? Um, I think at the time, I think it might have just been males. I'm not 100 percent certain uh, how how they counted, how they factored in women into the population of it. So I don't know if it was just voters or if it was whites versus slaves or whatever it was. It wouldn't matter if it's 50-50 population. That's true, yeah. If, I mean, if there's a re re reasonably equal distribution of men and women, the fractions would be about the same. But uh, but I don't know if that would be true with slaves or not. So, uh, anyway, so it, the, the point was is that the southern slave-owning states wanted basically more power than this. And so it's no surprise that I think out of like something like uh, – what was it 20, like uh, 20 out of the first 22 presidential elections or something went to a Virginia slave owner, right? And this is essentially why. Thomas Jefferson, for example, in the 1800 election uh, would have lost if you hadn't counted the slaves in the, in the representation. <clears throat> Which was a big deal for Tom, John, John Adams' uh, campaign. <laughs> anyway, the point, the reason why I bring this up, aside from the fact that I'll have to put my little plug in here. None of those reasons still exist. <laughs> All right? None of them. <laughs> so the whole basis for the Electoral College, I argue, just doesn't happen anymore. Maybe you could argue the second one. Well, right. I'm going to try to argue one day. <laughs> one doesn't work anymore because of the way we distribute the, the votes now. <clears throat> the electors don't vote their conscience. They're, they're forced to vote most of the time by the, their state rules to vote for the popular vote. So really, it's not, it's the, what one was supposed to do doesn't happen anymore, and it hasn't happened since the early 1800s. And the, the, idea the, the, the idea of the electors was that you vote for the person you trust to vote for you, and then he votes his mind. The way the electors are now is the popular vote says 51% went to Clinton, and so every single elector from that state has to vote for Clinton. That's the current way, which is totally different than the, than the original promise. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, but the point is all three of these reasons shifted the power of the election. The first one shifted the power completely to the electors. The populace would have no more power or say in what happened with the president except in the selection of who the electors are. Does that make sense? However, by, by about, like, I think 1820, almost every state had determined that the way they wanted their electors to vote was determined by the popular vote of the state. So they completely nullified the whole first point of the electoral college within about 30 years. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years or so. I think it took about until 1880, I think, for every state to, to basically do it that way, except I guess Maine and Nebraska don't do it that way. But anyway, <clears throat> the second one, the one about uh, the smaller states getting uh, uh, more representation because they wanted to represent by state, this gave greater power to voters in small population states compared to large population states. And this actually is still true today. For example, the state of Wyoming, which has only three electoral votes, in the last election, about 259,000 people voted in Wyoming. Okay? Uh, that, since they have three out of the 538 electoral votes, 
and they have, and each elector, each voter there has about one out of 259,000 power, right? The total amount of voting power that someone in Wyoming wielded in the presidential election was 2.15 times 10 to the negative 6% of the voting power of the choosing the president, each individual person in Wyoming. In California, which has 55 electoral votes, but 14.6 million people voted, <clears throat> so their portion of the total of the total vote was 55 out of 538 times the one over 14.6 million. So each individual voter in California only wielded about seven times 10 to the negative seven percent of the vote. So essentially, a voter in Wyoming was worth three voters in California. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> But this is essentially the effect that the smaller states were going for, was that the smaller states should be able to build more power so that there's, the, the idea, the reason why they justified it was that there should be an amount of state by state power. So it's not just a, feder, it's a federation, it's not a, you know, just a group of people, right? It's not a single nation, it's a federation of small states. That's why we call it the federal government, right? It's the government of the federation of states. <clears throat> uh, anyway. So the, I think two is probably the one that you could probably argue philosophically may still be that may still be the right way to do it for our country. It, it all kind of comes down to I suppose uh, whether or not you think the president should be a representative of the people or is a representative of the states. If he's a representative of the states, having some sort of federal federation kind of rule makes sense. And so there's there's a I think a logical argument there in favor of the electoral college. Um, it certainly changes the way our, our, our candidates campaign. If we went to just a straight popular vote and still won by plurality, everybody would just, would just campaign in Texas and California and in New York, and that'd be it. Whereas now, they just campaign in you know, Ohio and Florida and North Carolina, and that's it. But you know, the, <laughs> the, it definitely does change things, though, a little bit. And we'll actually uh, look at this a little bit more carefully at the end of the talk. Uh, the third one gave greater power to votes in, uh, to voters in slave-owning states than voters in free states, which we kind of already talked about. But basically, the whole idea of the Electoral College was to shift the distribution of power, change the distribution of power for the voters, because some of the voters, some, some of the people that built our country didn't feel that everybody should get an equal say <clears throat> in who the president was. All right, so the question we want to really look at is, how do you quantify this this effect? I mean, we can all agree that that you know giving more representation to smaller states would increase the amount of power that a voter in a smaller state has in the presidential election. But by how much and how much does it make a difference? The way I did it just a minute ago is I equally distributed amongst all the voters, right? And that's certainly one way to do it. But if you look at the way that we talked about the Senate in the first in the first example, if you have a, con a controlling coalition, then the other voters have nothing. For example, how much would the regular person say a Democratic voter has uh, power-wise in, in a Utah election when voting for president? Almost zero. Yeah, I think Utah's voted blue something like five times in the last 150 years, right? You know, so the, the <clears throat> and three of those were probably FDRs. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is, is that it's not just as simple as you just distribute amongst the voters because you can have things like coalitions. You can have things where certain groups of people have greater power and things like that. And so we're going to kind of investigate this a little bit more carefully and try to quantify. And so this brings us to our first uh, uh, mathematician here. This is Lloyd Shapley. He actually, I, I feel really bad, he actually just died about two weeks ago. Uh, but he was a mathematician, an economist, and an awesome game theorist. He was, so if you've ever seen A Beautiful Mind, you guys know about John Nash, and when he went to Princeton, he had this group of friends, right? Now, the people in A Beautiful Mind aren't real, but he was actually one of John Nash's actual friends at Princeton when they were in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, he and, th and two other guys, including one of the other guys, the Schubert guy here, uh, created a game called, um, what's it? well, John Nash's name before it was really vulgar, so I won't repeat that one, but the, <laughs> the actual, the, the current name for it is, uh, is, um, Oh, I totally just lost it. It's uh, something like gotcha sucker or something like that. I mean, it's, 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 it's something, it's something really, the, the idea is to basically like bankrupt your, your opponents and it's, a, it's kind of a card game of sorts or a chip game. 
Uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting in terms of how they play it mathematically. <clears throat> uh, you, so Long Sucker, that's the name of it. So, so Long Sucker. And I think you can actually buy it. But uh, anyway, so Lloyd Shapley, um, Martin Schubick, uh, these two gentlemen uh, created what's called the Shapley Schubick Power Index. And so to explain this, I'm going to give several examples here where we can kind of get this because it builds up to, to where we're going with this. So say you have a five member committee and they're just voting on an issue. So a lot of the things we'll talk about here apply more to like uh, elections for like a Congress or a city council or, or a board of directors or something trying to vote on an issue rather than maybe electing a person or a representative. But the same concept applies to if you're voting on, on you know, on who to elect. It's just the motion is should this person be president? But we'll talk about it in the context of like committee voting and stuff. So say you have a council of five members, they're voting on an issue. They'll vote independent of party lines, so you can assume that their voting is totally free. There's no influence one way or the other. <clears throat> All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna rank them according, so say you have a motion on the floor. We're gonna rank the five committee members according to their level of commitment to the passing of the motion. So, now, arguably, this is probably hard to do in real life, but let's just, for the sake of argument, say we can do this. This produces a preference order, say like this. So in this preference order, A is the most committed to passing the issue. B is the next most committed, and so on. So, the, it's, you know, so for example, E is the least committed, which might mean he might really want it not to pass, kind of thing. Does that make sense? So it's just the level of commitment overall. It could be negative commitment. So it's not how intense they are, how passionate they are about the subject, it's directional. If they want it to pass, yes, how much, A. exactly, it's how much they want it to pass. The person who wants, wants it to pass the most is A. Okay, and E might be very passionate, but going in the other direction. But could be going in the other direction, yeah. So he may want it to pass the, but his, his idea, E is the person who wants it to pass the least, which may be, I want it not to pass very strongly. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, so in this case then, now a simple majority passes, passes the motion. Okay, and say this is the preference order. Okay. Regardless of how the five people vote, if you notice, since it takes three votes to win, every single win, win or loss or whatever, everything is exactly the way C wants it to be. Does that make sense? Because he's right in the middle. So if C votes for it, then that means that both A and B also voted for it and it passes. If C votes against it, then that means D and E both also voted against it and the motion fails. So who has the power? C. C. C makes the entire decision at this point. He's a, he's, sort of, he's a dictator for this one preference of order. Now, the preference order is not always going to be the same. Okay? So, <clears throat> so as, but as long as this is the preference order, C completely controls the vote. We call C pivotal for this preference order, which is kind of the notion of he's a dictator for this preference order. <clears throat> so, his total amount of power, what the Shavely Shooter Power Index does, is it looks at the collection of all possible preference orders and says what fraction of those is C the pivotal voter. And which is essentially in every possible way you can order those five voters, how many times is C dead center? Okay, well let's figure it out. How, we have five voters, how many different ways can you order five things? Five factorial, 120 different ways. In those, of those, how many times does C appear in the middle? Well, yeah, it's one fifth of the time. It's 24 of those times, right? So if you, if you look at every possible thing, he has 24 times when he's directly in the middle, so he's pivotal 24 of the 120 times, which is one fifth of the time. So he has one fifth of the power. This assumes, this assumes that every preference order is equally likely, okay? This is a problem which we'll, we'll, we'll consider a little bit later, but for the sake of what we're gonna do for probably about the next 70% of the slides, is we're going to assume that every preference order is equally likely. Okay, just so we can understand what's going on. In the case that every preference order is equally likely, every single one of the different people, because it doesn't matter if it's C, A, B, or, or D, the computation would be the same, every single one of them holds one fifth of the power. Okay? Which is exactly what you would expect in, in, under such a circumstance. So the, that's one positive thing for the shapely Schubert power index, is it at least gives you the expected, uh, the expected quantity for a situation that seems pretty straightforward. All right, so let's complicate it a little bit more. And let's say we have a four-member committee. And what's wrong with a four-member committee where a uh, simple majority passes motions? What can you have? Ties, two-two tie. All right, so let's say we have a chairman of the board. 
And the way the bylaws work for this kid, for this board is that if there ever is a tie, the chairman gets to cast a second vote. Does that make sense? So in other words, if there's ever a tie, the chairman's way goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> how, where's the distribution of power in this case? So let's just take a look at any possible preference order, any preference order you want. In the event of a non-tie, where there are actually three people who voted for one way or the other, then no matter how it goes, the two people in the middle of the four, right? So I mean, if I list them as A, B, C, D, the two guys in the middle always vote for whichever way wins. If there's three that vote, four. Does that make sense? So if it's a three to one vote, these two guys in the middle always vote the way that wins. Okay, so well, almost, because that's in the event of a non-tie. So the only case to consider is what happens if there's a tie. If there's a tie, then the two middle guys voted differently. So it depends on who is the, where the uh, chairman is, okay? If the chairman, I'll, which I'll denote by X, is over here, then C voted with the winning side, because X will, because he gets a second vote in the top. Does that make sense? Okay. If X is over here, then B gets it. So essentially, the pivotal guy, since the two guys in the middle are always, always vote winning the, the way it wins in the event of a non-tie, then the only case to consider is what happens in a tie. And the person who votes with the win there out of those two is the one who voted on the side of the chairman. Okay? So the pivotal voter in this collection here is whoever is in the center that's on the same side as the chairman. That's who's pivotal. Does that make sense? This happens twice for the chairman because he can be in either position. And it happens once for each of the other guys. Now, of course, when I say that, I mean the way they can be ordered in the middle. There's orderings that can happen around them, right? Okay, so let's take a look at that. Okay, so in the event of a tie, the member in the middle on the same side of the chairman wins. So this happens for the chairman. So there's 24 possible orderings here, right? Okay, the chairman is in the middle 12 of those times. I'll let you take a second to think about that. Okay. <laughs> it's combinatorical, and I don't know, it's not my strong suit either, but there's 12 guys, it happens for the chairman 12 times. Okay, and for the other guys, they, they only get it in one of the two slots, right? Uh, and so that happens four times for each of them. So the, uh, <clears throat> oops, so the chairman ends up with half of the power and each of the other members end up with just one sixth of the power. Okay? Does that make sense? You can kind of see why the other members get four, by the way, because if C is going to be pivotal, that means X has to be on his side, so that has to be there. So the only thing you can do is swap these guys. So there's two positions there. If C is in this position and he's pivotal, the next has to be here, and there's just two possibilities there too. So there's only four possibilities where C is pivotal. Can you define pivotal for me again? I lost it. Oh yeah, sure. Pivot, uh, a voter is pivotal if, if every single vote goes his way. Given the ordering here? So given a preference ordering, okay, regard, so once you have the preference ordering down, however the votes go, if there's a guy where the vote always goes the way he votes, no matter who votes what in that order, uh, then, then he's pivotal. So for example, if this is the order in here, C ends up as pivotal because no matter how these guys vote, if it's three to one, it's either this way or this way, in which case C voted for the winner. If it's two to two, then it's here and here, and this side wins because X is there. So in every single possibility, C wins, gets his way, is what I mean. So the pivotal voter in a preference order is the one who always gets his way. So the notion of uh, power for the shape of the Schubert power index is the ratio of preference order. So the number, the fraction of preference orders for which you're pivotal. So your your co your collection of uh, preference orders where you're the pivotal voter. And then you can show that it has to have the one for everybody. Yeah, it, I mean, essentially, I, do, I think this would turn out to be that you can only have one pivotal voter. In oh. preference order. That's always true. Okay. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So for yeah, given a preference order, there's only one pivotal one. Now this won't be true when we when we move things along a little bit more, but for this kind of basic idea, uh, you have that case. Alright, so here the chairman of the board ends up with half of the power and each individual only has a sixth of the power. And it adds up to one. So that's kind of that's pretty neat uh, that you can think of it like that. All right, so let's look at a small Senate and see if we can get our hands on a more complicated example. Because eventually where I want to go with this is I want to, I want to actually compute the legislative power of the president. How much can he legislate? 
And now mind you, he's not in the legislative branch, right? The executive branch. So how much does he affect the legislative branch is the question. All right, so, but before we get there, let's just talk about a uh, random example. So consider a 24 member Senate. Same rule as before with the four person committee. You can still have a 12-12 tie, and in the event of a tie, the Senate president is the one who, whose way goes, okay? So you have the exact same effect here. If you have a winner, a, a straight win, a non-tie, the two guys in the middle always vote for the winning side. The only time that doesn't happen is in a tie. So you get the exact same effect. The guy in the middle who's on the side of the Senate president is the one who's pivotal. Does that make just, just like before. Okay. So then we really just have to figure out how many times this happens for each person. All right, so it gets a little bit more complicated because there's more things happening. All right, so let's look at the Senate president first. The Senate president uh, can only have two possibilities where he's the pivotal voter, whether he's the one on the more preferred side or the guy in the middle on the least less preferred side, which would make this kind of ordering. So there's 11 senators here, then the Senate president, then 12 senators here, or vice versa. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. The Senate president is pivotal in both of these circumstances. So we just need to add up the number of ways this can happen. Well, the number of senators that can occur here is just 23 choose 11, right? And they can be ordered 11 factorial times and 12 factorial times here for those guys. So the total number of ways this can happen is 23 choose 11 times 11 factorial times 12 factorial. That's the possible number of orders. It happened, this is identical, so it really happens for them twice. So the total number of ways in which the Senate president becomes pivotal is 2 times 23 choose 11 times 11 factorial times 12 factorial, which this is nice because it's the denominator of this guy. So you just get 2 times 23 factorial. <clears throat> All right. Now, what about for a regular Senate member? How many times does he become pivotal? So this happens in a circumstance like this, where just for the, just for the sake of visualization first, let's say the Senate president absolutely most preferred the motion at this point. And A is the guy in the middle who's on the preferred side. So he becomes the pivotal voter. How many ways can this happen? Well, it's the same kind of thing. The, if the Senate president is required to be the most approved, most approving guy, then you have 22 choose 10 times 10 factorial for the number of ways you can order that times 12 factorial for the number of ways you can order that. And it happens twice because he could be on the other side too. Now, the president doesn't have to be in that position. He could potentially be in any one of those 11 positions above. So there's actually 11 times of the, those things that could happen. So the total number of possibilities for A to be pivotal is 2 times 11 times 22 choose 10 times 10 factorial times 22 factorial. And you whoo, get this big thing over here. 2 times 11 factorial times 22 factorial. There's 24 factorial possible preference orders. Okay. Are we, are we good? It's 24 factorial total preference. Top. Just wait till we get to the actual Congress. <laughs> There's 24 factorial possible preference order. So to figure out the total power, you take the fraction where the Senate president was pivotal and divide it by 24 factorial. Then you take the amount where, the, where each individual person was and divide that by 24 factorial, and that'll give you the power for each group, for each person. Okay, does that make sense? So <clears throat> the Senate president, it's 2 times 23 factorial over 24 factorial, which actually simplifies really nice, right? You get 2 over 24. He has 1 twelfth of the power. Any other member has the power index like this. And when you cancel all that out, you get 11 twelfths divided by 23. So what's interesting is that both in the case of the four committee members and the 24 committee members with the same rule, you get one twelfth the power for the chairman, or you know, one, some amount of power for the chairman, and then whatever's left over is divided evenly amongst the rest. So in this case, you had half the power for the president, and the other three had to had to divvy up the other half. Okay, here you, the other twenty-three had to divvy up the other eleven twelfths. That's available. Is it always one divided by half the total number? Yes. Yes, I think I think that'd be the case because I think you end up with this ordering every, two, every single time. <clears throat> All right, so that's cool. So we kind of have a theorem there for that type of committee. So if the Senate president gets to enact a second vote whenever there's a tie, but everybody else gets a single vote, and you assume that every preference ordering is equally as likely, yeah. then, then this is the, the distribution of power. 
That last one is the one that's not really true at all. <laughs> okay, but we'll get to that. Simple first, right? Simple first. <laughs> okay. All right. Total power again is one. It's always the case. Okay. The moment you've all been waiting for. Let's see just how much power the president actually has. Okay? The legislative power of the president. So the president, as I said, is in the executive branch, not the legislative branch. So he can't propose, well, I mean, I suppose he can propose a bill if there's a you know, congressional sponsor too or whatever. But the, the president can't enact legislation. He can't force a bill through. He can't choose to pass a bill or anything like this. So how does the president affect the legislation? What's his ability? Veto power. That's how he affects the legislation. This is the check and balance of Civics 101, right? This is the check and balance that the executive branch has over the legislative branch is the veto power. So just how much power is veto power, okay? Well, in order for the, for the president to even see a bill, it has to first do what? Pass. Has to pass with a simple majority of both the House and the Senate. Then it goes to the president, and then he gets to say whether he approves it or not. If he approves it, it's a law. If he says, I don't like this, it gets sent back to the House and Senate, and they can overrule him by doing what? Two-thirds majority. So if there's enough, and that's the back other part of the check and balance. If the legislative branch, if two-thirds of the legislative branch in both houses, not cumulative, but individually in both houses, uh, says we want the, the, the law to be a law, it passes anyway, regardless of what the president said. Okay? So in that, in that circumstance, the president doesn't have any say. So essentially, the president doesn't have any say in the election if it doesn't pass the House. It, sorry, it doesn't have any say on the motion if it doesn't pass the House or the Senate and doesn't have any say if, if the bill has two-thirds of support in both the Senate and House. Does that make sense? In that case, the president's opinion is moot. Okay. His opinion only matters in the other circumstance. Okay, so currently there's 100 senators and 435 members of the House of Representatives. <clears throat> now we're going to have lots of fun. Really, really big numbers. I had to do this in Maple in order to actually get the numbers out. <laughs> All right. So first off, like I said, a bill doesn't even go before the president without it passing the simple majority in the House. So it'd probably be good for us to know the simple majority and two-thirds majority for each of these groups. A simple majority amongst the 435 members of the House is 218. A two-thirds majority is 290. Uh, for the House, for the Senate, it's 51 and 67. Okay? That makes sense. Everybody should be able to get that one, right? <laughs> okay. So now, let's consider a preference ordering of Congress and the President. So you take all 535 members of Congress and the President, and you rank them in preference of who wants the support of the bill the most, all the way down to who wants it the least. Okay? Massive preference order. Don't try to do this at home. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, suppose that X House members and Y Senate members precede the President on this particular order. And let's just see what it takes for them to be pivotal. Okay? <clears throat> How many ways this can happen. All right, those that precede the president, since there's X and Y of them, can be ordered X plus Y factorial times. Different ways, right? Those that come after them, of course, are what remains factorial. Do you with me? So that's the how many ways you can shuffle the people in front and the people behind. <clears throat> Which senators precede the president, so the Y numbers come from here, and the X numbers come from here, right? We're just choosing that many. So the total number of ways that X House members and Y Senate members can precede the president then is this number times this number times this number times this number. Does that make sense? That's a big product, right? I didn't even try to count the digits. It was about six lines on my like 29-inch monitor in April. Anyway, <laughs> it was huge. <clears throat> so here's the number of ways in which X House members and Y Senate members can precede the president. Since I don't want to write it every time, I'll just call this N X Y. Okay? All right. So the number of ways in which X House, X House members and Y Senate members can precede the president is that. So under what circumstances is the president pivotal? Well, the president is pivotal every single time his opinion makes a difference, right? In other words, every single time it passes into, so that he actually gets to see the bill, and every time there isn't enough support to overrule him. At that point, whatever the president says goes. Does that make sense? So he has all of the power, or is pivotal, in every preference order of that sort, okay? Where there's enough support to get it to him, but not enough support to overrule him. 
okay? Which means that x and y have to be, x has to be bigger, so x is the house, x has to be bigger than, what was it, 218. Y bigger than or equal to 218. Y has to be bigger than or equal to 51, okay? But, la but, they, but they can't both be bigger than uh, 290 and 67. It's okay for one of them to be bigger, but not the other, okay? So to figure out how many different ways the president is pivotal, we're going to add all those things up. So we've got the, the, the amount of control for down there. That's what I just said. So to add them all up, this is the number of ways, the number of, of situations where the bill goes before the president. Okay? This is the number of ways in which there's enough support in the House and Senate together to overrule the president. So if I take the number of ways the bill comes before the president and subtract the number of ways he's overruled, then that's the number of ways the president is pivotal. Right. Does that make sense? So this is the number of ways that the president is pivotal divided by the total 536 factorial possible orderings. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> and it comes out to about 0 0.16, 0 0.16. Wow. So the president actually has roughly 16% of the legislative decision-making power in the country, assuming every preference ordering is equally likely, which is totally not true, okay? So for example, if you have a Republican-controlled Congress, the likelihood that the preference ordering is in favor of the Republicans goes up dramatically, okay? In which case the president has even more power because there will be more situations where he has enough support to get a bill in front of him or, and, and, and such. Now, of course, if it's a really Republican-controlled Congress, then the president may not matter at all because it might always have enough support that that it that it does it over. So it's not just the president's power goes up. If he's if even if he is a Republican president, if you have like 90% of Congress is Republican, the Republican president still doesn't matter legislatively. Does that make sense? So it it's it's sort of I don't know. You could probably try to graph what it would be, but you'd have to. It's a much harder problem because you have to deal with like what are the probabilities of each preference order and giving the makeup of Congress. Okay, so that's a much more complicated and difficult question. But under just the simple assumption that every possible preference ordering is equally likely, it's still relatively complicated to figure this out. Now, what's interesting is that even in that case, it actually depends on the number of people in Congress. So, for example, the amount of legislative power that the president holds has actually changed over the years as we've increased the number of members of Congress. The original Congress, during George Washington's first term, at the end of his term, because it changed a little bit because a couple of states I think ratified during his first term. At the end of his term, uh, the president only had about 14.8% of the legislative power. So the president is actually more, slightly more powerful now than he was back in George Washington's day. Yeah? I don't know enough about government, but my question is, they do the first vote in the House and in the Senate, and then let's say the president vetoes, and then they vote again. Do people change the way they vote in between? It's possible. So, I mean, it, it, the, the reality of the situation is considerably more complicated than what I've explained here. Uh, because they can change their vote. There's also, there's also the effect that if the, that if the bill originates in the House of Representatives, they get a chance to, to approve it first, and then they can send it to the Senate, and the Senate can actually make amendments and say, we'll only approve it under these circumstances, and they approve it, and they send it back to So, I mean, there's a, there's a mess of different possibilities that can actually happen. So to get your hands on the actual power of the president, is probably close to intractable. Yeah. Uh, but uh, from just a s sort of simplistic, basic standpoint, it's probably pretty close to this in a Congress that's relatively equal in power. So you have relatively equal, I, I, would, I would assume, relatively equal Republican and Democrat support in both houses. It's probably pretty close that preference orders are what if close to simple. What close to against their like preference because they knew the president would be like anyway. Just for their record. Then, I mean, that's another situation that you have to run yeah. into. So, in that case, you're dealing with probabilities for each of these different individuals, and it gets extremely complicated. Okay. Which is why I didn't do it. <laughs> you're, just, you're just calling every senator and asking for their. What's your likelihood of voting for this one? And it probably, it probably then depends too on what the bill is, on how much power the president has. If it's an extremely popular bill, the president may not have any power, right? So, this is also motion specific, not just not just a, a makeup of the Congress specific. Okay. If you notice, these preference orderings depended on what the motion was that was put in front of them, and that can change. 
All right, so let's talk about, uh, get a little bit more realistic here. Before, everybody was voting independently, which is part of why it was realistic to think that all the, all the orderings were equal alike. But this isn't the way it is in real life. We have these things called coalitions. And what a coalition is, it's a group of voters that typically all vote rough, roughly the same way. Okay? They don't have to, but most of the time they do. Yeah? Can I ask one quick question before I forget? Sure. So let me see if I grasp what you just said correctly. There could be probabilities on the preference orders if the motion is just right so that the president maybe even goes up to all the way 100% power if you set it up just right. Potentially. It's always going to be in between. Potentially. I mean, think about it. If you had a, if you had a somewhat partisan but enough bipartisan bill to make up a Congress was just right that it was going to get passed, right. but the uh, but not enough support to overrule the president. In, those, in that circumstance, the president has all the, all the power. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, but again, that's sort of motion specific, and each motion carries its own set of probabilities for what order right. the preferences are. Yes, absolutely. All right, so let's take a look at this idea of coalitions since I'm kind of running low, low on time. Political parties are examples of coalitions, especially in the case where they're like con congressional members, like elected officials. Uh, a Republican in Congress is far more likely to vote Republican on an issue than a standard Republican in America. Does that make sense? Because they're kind of, it's kind of one of the reasons why they elected, right, was to, was to represent that constituency. So this definitely represents what we call a coalition. A winning coalition is one that favors the motion and is large enough that if that under the circumstance that all the members of that coalition vote for it, the motion will pass. So for example, right now, the Republicans in Congress have a winning coalition. The Republicans in the Senate and, well, and in the House both have a winning coalition. Okay, if everybody, if all the Republicans vote for it, it'll pass. Ignoring the president. Ignoring the president. Just, just, just the congressional motion itself. A blocking coalition is the opposite. It's, it's one where it opposes the motion and has enough strength to, to remove. So if the, mo so you, the Republicans have a winning coalition if it's a Republican motion, and they have a blocking coalition if it's a Democrat motion. Does that make sense? Okay, just under sort of simplistic, you're gonna vote party line. Maybe. <clears throat> okay, so a critical or a swing voter, this is what we mean by swing voter, is a voter that's a member of that coalition but has the property that if he chose to not vote with the coalition, the coalition no longer is guaranteed to win. Does that make sense? So if your coalition is just right, then, and one voter says, I'm gonna switch, and that coalition can't win anymore, that's what we mean by a swing vote, okay? You can kind of guess who has most of the power. The swing voters have most of the power. All right, so let's go back to our four committee member uh, group with the chairman X, okay? <clears throat> and let's take a look at the different coalitions that exist there. So a winning coalition is any coalition that has enough votes to guarantee their motion always passes. For the four-member coalition, you have to have three votes to pass anything. Now, in the event of a tie, the, the, the chairman gets a second vote. So you have to count that as part of the winning coalition. So the Senate chairman paired with any other member of the, of the committee is a winning coalition. Because if they choose to do something, it passes. Does that make sense? No matter what. Now, in that case, if either one of them choose to vote with the other group, it potentially could fail. Does that make sense? In fact, if, if it is true that the other two are going to vote against it, then that person definitely has the power to choose and switch sides and say that's the way it's going to be. In which case, both of those voters, both the chairman and the other person, are swing voters for that coalition. Does that make sense? Because if they switch their vote, the motion doesn't pass anymore or is no longer guaranteed to pass. ABC also happens to be a winning coalition. So if all, everybody other than the Senate, the, the committee chairman are gonna vote for something, then the committee chairman can't do anything about it. Does that make sense? And in that case, each one of them are critical, or uh, by the way, critical and swing vote are the same, same. XAB is a winning coalition, but in this case, neither A nor B are critical. Because if either one of them individually switched their vote, he still can win. That coalition can still win. Does that make sense? So the only critical voter in this case is X. If he switches to the other side, they can't win anymore. You make, does that make sense? <clears throat> so a coalition where no, where no, with no critical voters, okay, 
is something called invulnerable, which is sort of a misnomer, because we're operating essentially under the assumption that only one person could change their vote. It's possible a group of people could change their vote, and then things get a little wonky. Yeah, so you could have an invulnerable coalition where half of them decide to change their vote, and suddenly the coalition lost again. That, that happens. But under this sort of simplistic idea where only one person potentially changes their vote, then that's what we call an invulnerable one, where it doesn't matter if one person changes their vote, the coalition is still in. A coalition where every voter is critical, like the XA winning coalition before, is called a minimal winning coalition, meaning you really have to make sure that coalition works. So this actually then gives strategy to the other side, right? If you know who the critical voters are in the, in the coalition, who are you going to go after to try to get to switch their votes? Right? You're going to look for the critical voter. If you can get just one of the critical voters to change their mind, boom, the motion doesn't pass. Okay? So that's kind of an, that's, that's kind of interesting. You definitely see this happen in Congress, right? When a motion's passing, if it's a, if it's a close, if the parties are roughly equally distributed and it's a close vote, suddenly the moderates in each group become the swing voters and essentially determine whether the motion passes on their, on their opinion. The people who are extreme on the other sides mean nothing. All right, so using this idea, how do you come up with a power index for this? So I'm kind of, kind of run low on time, so maybe I'll go through this a little bit faster. This is Lionel Penrose. He had a bunch of really smart kids. One of his kids is Roger Penrose, who is responsible for all the general relativity cosmology stuff, so he's really cool. But anyway, he was a mathematician, a psychiatrist, a geneticist, and a chess theorist. <laughs> Back in the day when you could be practically anything you wanted. <laughs> now we sort of have the big, I guess. Uh, and then this guy, John Banjaf, Banjaf? I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Ban Banjaf? I'm not going to say Banjaf. But anyway, he's still alive. Uh, he's a lawyer, actually. But he, he got into this because uh, one of the things that he's really interested in is uh, the, the lawsuits that he brings forth are things that he feels are really good for society. So he'll he'll sue some he'll sue for something if he thinks that society would be better with that with that sort of legal precedent. Does that make sense? Uh, anyway, uh, as a result, he got involved with some of the the voting politics in a local city uh, uh, committee elections kind of stuff. And this is where he came up with using some of the ideas from Lionel Penrose to produce what's called now called the Banzai Power Index. Uh, and <clears throat> what it does. Is the Banzhaf power index is the power is the fraction of the total number of swing votes that somebody can cast. So you calculate all possible swing votes that can be cast, find out how many of them are voter A, and that fraction is his power. So the fraction of swing votes he can cast is how much power he holds in the election. Then, so that's how he defined power. So, for example, if you go to this four committee collection, uh, selection, these are the list of all the winning coalitions. Each column here, the rows here indicate it's a one if that member is a swing vote, a uh, critical voter for that coalition. Okay? So, A, B, and C are all critical for there. A, X, and A are, are there. X and C all the way down over here. At this point, only X is the critical voter. This is an example of an invulnerable coalition where no one's a critical voter. Somebody can change their mind, the motion will still pass. So then if you add up how many are X, how many are A, B, and C, the total is 12. So there's a total possible of 12 swing votes that can be cast for any possible winning coalition in this, in this group of 12, in this group of uh, four committee members. Six of them can be cast by the committee chair. And so the committee chairman has six out of 12, or one half of power, kind of just like we figured out before. The other guys end up with one, with as you would expect, uh, one sixth of the power. So this action ends up to be the same as the Stanley Schubert one, the Shapley Schubert one for this one. <clears throat> All right. So I'm kind of running a little bit low on time, but there's a pretty cool theorem that says that the number of winning coalitions in which a voter is critical is the same as the number of locking condition blue coalitions in which the voter is critical. Kind of makes sense, right? Because if if <clears throat> This guy's in the middle and he can determine the election and he can move and determine the election the other way too. Uh, anyway, there's also a notion of a voting block. Now this is a group of voters that are guaranteed to vote the same way. So they make a pledge and say we're going to vote. Some, usually the way this happens in the committee is you'll have one person who's acting by proxy for two people that aren't present or something like that. His vote now counts for three. Okay? A voting block that basically then can be considered as a single voter who just gets to cast more votes. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, because he sort of has greater weight 
in the preference ordering, he becomes a critical voter more often. Okay? So as a result, uh, the, uh, the, because of that, he becomes a critical voter more often, so he ends up having more power. So the example of a seven-member seven committee that has a three-member block, you can consider the block is basically a single voter. So there's really only five voters in the committee, one that's worth three and four that are each worth one. And if you look at that, it turns out that the, uh, the voting block holds three-fifths of the voting power. And the other three-fifths, the other two-fifths have to be distributed equally across the other four. So they only have one-tenth of the power. So that basically means if you were to equally distribute this among the voters in the block, each of the voters in the block have one-fifth of the voting power, because there's three of them, which means they are twice as powerful as the other members of the committee. So suddenly forming a block becomes really, really desirable. Because if you can get a group of people that are guaranteed to vote the same way, your power increases dramatically. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's actually pretty cool, right? That you can, that you can drastically affect the amount of power you have. Uh, here's a theorem about what happens if you have a single voting block. But anyway, I wanted to get back to the Electoral College because I promised that it was there. The Electoral College is essentially breaks the country up into voting blocks. Okay? So instead, it, it says forget the popular vote. It doesn't matter. Each state is its own voting block, especially with this winner take all. So forget for a minute that Maine and Nebraska do it differently. Just pretend that every state does it as a winner take all kind of situation. That means that every state is a voting block that has as many votes as it has electoral votes. And how it's determined how that block will vote is determined by the popular vote in each state. But it's still essentially a single voter. So California, for example, is a single voter with 55 votes. Does that make sense? Utah is a single voter with six votes. Okay, in this case, you know, and the quota, of course, to win the presidency is you have to have 270 total votes, and that, that wins the majority, okay? So, <clears throat> you can't quite do it exactly the way we did before, but still essentially the same thing holds, that the larger the block, the higher the shape the shape the shoe power index is, okay? Because there'll be a critical voter in more preference order. That makes sense. So, for example, California, the largest block in the, in the union, with 55 votes, which is 17 more than the next largest block. So it's huge, humongous block. So, which means that among the possible preference orderings of the states, California is pivotal in way more of them than any other state. So why isn't California a swing state? We've actually already answered that here today. Why isn't California a swing state? Does anybody ever consider California a swing state? They're always at one end of the preference order. Always at one end of the preference order. See, the problem here, the reason why he doesn't become a swing state is because not every preference ordering is equally likely. In fact, for California, they almost always vote blue, which means they're always at the blue end of the voting end of the spectrum, which means it's very unlikely for them to be in the middle. And you have to be in the middle to be a swing voter. Does that make sense? So California never ends up in the middle, so it's never a swing voter. So how much power do you think California voters actually have? <laughs> None. They have no power almost in the election, OK? The swing states are Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Colorado, Iowa, Nevada, and New Hampshire. Look how small some of their amounts of voting are. <laughs> so the, what's that? That changes every few elections. So the, 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 the right, right. The, the, this was I can't remember which which newspaper I used, but uh, it's classified by, by how frequently they've switched sides, right? So they're the, the, basically the idea of a swing voter. That the way the newspaper usually defines it is how frequently they are to flip flop back and forth between Republican and Democrat, which is essentially the idea of how often are they going to be in the center of the preference list. Does that make sense? If they do, if they flip-flop more often, they're more likely to be in the center. And if they're in the center, they're more likely to be pivotal, which is why they become swing states. Okay? Which, so even though they're really small, they become really important because they're the only ones that you really can convince. That's why Hillary Clinton probably never made a visit to Utah. So it didn't matter. Right? Or if she did, it was a layover. You know? But, <laughs> right? Because it didn't matter to her. It also didn't really matter to Donald Trump because he knew that it was going to go red. Right? So how much voting power does a Utah have? Zero, practically, for all practical purposes, has almost none. 
All right, so let me finish up real quick here. So this basically means if you're in a state that almost votes one way, the likelihood of your state ends up in, in the middle of a preference order is very small, hence your state has very little power, if any at all. Uh, so really, if you wanted to really calculate the index power, the power index of each state, you'd have to first figure out what the likelihood is that they vote certain ways, which would determine sort of the preference order. It would be a very complicated problem to do, very hard to do, and it probably would change as time went on. Right? It's different for every single president because it's different for every single motion. Uh, so anyway, so that's kind of the, the situation we're in. All right, so to kind of close things off, uh, voting matters. So since, since ours and many other countries use elections to decide things, it's important. So hopefully, uh, we, we found in the first talk that voting systems can make a big difference on whether or not an election is fair. We realized, we found in the second talk, that it's extremely hard to find an election system that both always identifies a winner and is completely fair. In fact, we found that if it was based off of a preference profile, it's impossible to do. Uh, and so this is uh, a little bit hard, but it basically reduces the question not to which is the fair election system, to which is the most fair election system. Uh, and so no matter what election system you use, though, you're always going to end up getting voting blocks and coalitions. And that's going to change who has the power in the election. So even if you have a completely fair election, you could still end up in a situation where you have little or no power. You could also end up in a situation where you have a lot of power. People in Ohio and Florida enjoy a great deal of power in choosing a president. We don't, right? And it all depends on what is more likely to happen with your state. So there's a big probability problem, and uh, it gets really complicated. Anyway, if you're interested, uh, this is the book I read in order to get most of this information. Uh, it's uh, W.E. Wallace's Mathematics of Elections and Voting. It's a very short book. It doesn't cost very much. So if you're interested in learning more about this stuff, you can read there. Uh, and otherwise, that's it. Thanks for listening.